later. But here, the altar area for us represents what we call the pure land or the Buddha land. And the Buddha in English uh, translated is the Buddha immeasurable light in a measurable light. And this for us represents the Buddhist ideals of wisdom and compassion. And so the Buddha land here is also representative of that. It's the Founders Hall. In the central altar is the image of our founder, Shinran Choni. And it's, we place this image here not to so -called pray to the image itself, but rather as a reminder that this, this person here is the one who founded, not established a new religion, but rather expounded the religion for uh, those of us who follow it. Now, the teaching itself is based on the teaching from Shakyamuni Buddha. So the teaching goes all the way back to the earthly Buddha's time, 2,600 years ago. Shakyamuni, the earthly Buddha, was, as we uh, explained, appeared on the earth in order to talk about the Dharma. Now the Dharma has always existed. There are different, what we call Dharma bodies. The Dharma is actually the teaching itself. Now, in order for we human beings to understand it, Shakyamuni Buddha had to expound it to us. The Buddha, the earthly Buddha, did not come up with a new religion, but rather came up or awakened to it. And that's what we call enlightenment. He came to become uh, deeply aware of what the meaning of life itself was. Now in your study, uh, General Buddhism tells that there are over 84,000 different teachings. Now the number is actually insignificant. It tells of a large number because at that time there weren't very many people on the earth. And so the teaching, in other words, is for, there's a teaching for each individual. We may interpret it slightly differently, but the teaching itself is to bring about an awareness of what the meaning or significance of life is. Now for we Jodo Shinshu followers, we uh, are called, this is for the common people, because during Shinran's time, during the medieval period here in Japan, Buddhism had become kind of uh, just for the elite only. It was for the military class, it was for the court class. However, Shinran and his master teacher, Hon, in their own understanding of Buddhism, in their own throughout their life, came to realize that those who really needed the teaching, this teaching of compassion, were the common people because their lives were not very easy. As you know, life is not easy all the time. We don't always have things as we want. Things, we also come into difficulties throughout our life. How do we address those? These are questions that uh, transcend time. And for us, it's to become aware of what the here and now, what life itself is. Okay? And for us, that's why, as I stated earlier, the Buddha here, Amida Buddha, is actually the combination of Amitabha, Amitayus in Sanskrit which means the uh, tathagata, or the enlightened being from thusness, which is the manifestation of compassion and wisdom. Now all these terms, in English especially, um, in, China, in the Chinese when it was uh, traversed through Asia, light, if we all had to explain light, I'm sure each one of us would explain it differently, because we have our own experiences that go behind it. Likewise, light, I was a biology major, so we have to explain light. We come up with a thick thesis of what light is, but that doesn't really explain for the common person. Each one of us knows what light is because we know what darkness is. Likewise, compassion. What is compassion itself? These are terms that have no form, no color, but yet we understand what they are. And those are the hardest things to uh, transmit or explain to other people. For instance, in the West, we center on the idea of love. What is love exactly? We know it's that warm feeling that arises within us. But when does that start? When does that stop? How do we prevent that? Or how do we make that occur? No one knows. It just happens, right? Some of these things occur because of our experiences. All of them through both good and bad experiences. 
Now, this idea of good and bad is what we attach to it. This is what Buddhism teaches us. We human beings are full of these attachments. Uh, the Buddhist terminology is onno, or self-centered interests, self-centered desires. Okay? We want something to go always a certain way. That's how we are as human beings. Here, Shinra talked to us that we need to become aware of not what's outside there, but rather what's inside here. Right? Because for all of us, it's easier to see differentiations, both good and bad, in other people, but can we really see them in, in ourselves? And so this leads back to basic Buddhism idea of meditation or self-reflection. That's why you see other schools sitting in meditation. They follow these ideas to bring about this awareness, to find this seat of Buddhahood. But actually, going back, Shinong actually through his own research and his own study, came to understand that we human beings are just this conglomeration of all of these desires. If someone were to ask you, who are you? How do we start off? My name is such and such. I'm from wherever. I'm currently doing this kind of work. I'm related to such and such. So we're putting all of these different things around us. But what is the actual core of that? That's for us to ponder and think about. Now, I only have 30 minutes, so I can't really get too deep into the teaching itself, but um, to the left and to the right, it may be a bit hard for you to see, but you can look at them later. As I told you, we have three different types of main ob objects of worship. As you saw, the statue, the wooden statue of a standing Buddha, the scroll that I just pulled out, and then also these here all of which have this sort of radiant, radiance, uh, the nimbus <coughs> or aerial of light, the circle of light that's emitted from it. Because life itself, if you had to give it a shape, a color, or a type of uh, concept, is light. It radiates light. Light radiates warmth. This warmth is symbolic of compassion. And so, a different name that's given to the Buddha Amida is, or the different scrolls on the left and right are, Kimyo Jinji ko Mugeko Nyorai, or Take Refuge in the Tathagata of Unhindered Life Filling the Territory. And the other is Namo Kashiri ko, Namo Kashiri ko Nyorai, or Entrust Myself to the Tathagata of Inconceivable Life. The light itself, as you know, has no direction to it. Of course, if you hold a flashlight, the beam just goes out this way. But think of just a naked flame. Or on the altar here, the hanging lamps with the light. It's actually a, a lit flame. The light radiates in all directions, unhindered. One spark of light in total darkness, you would be able to see miles and miles away. So that's why even in English, the saying, the saying being, one light breaks the darkness. The darkness is symbolic for us of our ignorance. Uh, it's too easy, in, especially in today's world, to become caught up in too many things and just ignore uh, issues that are going on around us. Okay. Uh, we bring back this idea that once you learn something, you can never unlearn it. You try to forget about it, but you can never do that. So this is one big difference between Buddhism and, I don't want to point out a specific religion, but other religions. By merely admitting to something does not make it go away. You live with that experience throughout your life, whether you want to or not. You, whether you acknowledge it or not is up to you. And so this, this acknowledgement that comes to pass, you're being able to cope with it, deal with it, learn from it, and grow from it. So that's why, for us, it's to acknowledge, yes, we did that. That's why society in Asia is vastly different than society in the West. All of our experiences lead us to where we are today. So going back to basic Buddhism, that's why other priests and monk, monks sit in meditation to come to that awareness. 
But for Shinra, the most difficult practice is not sitting in meditation for hours and hours at a time. Or I, I follow the same path as you folks are doing. Studying from your textbooks, hours and hours for tests. The most difficult practice is living day to day with this awareness of what should I be doing correctly? How should I be living my life? And for us as Shinshi followers, it's based on this idea of the Buddha of measurable life. Everything around us is life itself. Think about it. Here, the lights, what the clothing that you're wearing, the breakfast that you ate, all of them have, quote unquote, a life. If you think about even commercials back home, the life of your car, the life of your battery. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that means. It's for however long that battery lasts. Okay, yes. But what happens after that so-called life ends? What do you do with it? In today's world, we just toss it away. But is that correct? The world's changing too. How? We're told recycle, reuse, reduce. Actually, this is an old concept from long ago, before we had very many things. Older folks reused things. They took it apart and reused it a different way. Uh, I don't know how long you've been here in Japan. How many of you know the uh, say, motainai? What does it mean? It's, why, why is it? That's the interpretation of what motainai is. Actually, motainai is threefold. This too, motainai is actually no subject. The subject is both, I am being wasteful, you are being wasteful, or it is wasteful. Right? The reason being, the characters themselves, motsu is from things, items. Tai is body, but it's actually, this is how it should be. And naimi is the ne negative, the negation of it. So when someone says motainai, it means, I am not using this item as it was intended to be used. That's why it's wasteful, right? But actually, different things can be used and reused and reused until what happens? It's returned to where it's supposed to be. So that's why in the past, when something, the life of it ended, it was returned to the earth so that other life may arise from it. Now, uh, the gold here on the altar itself. Like in many other religions, churches, temples, synagogues, etc., very elaborate. Uh, here as well, however, the focus for us is slightly different. As I told you, this is for us the symbol, symbolic representation of the Pure Land. The Pure Land, why do we call it the Pure Land? It's in contrast to the world that we live in. Because we're humans, yes, the world is as it is. I'm having a good life, etc., etc. But do we really have a peaceful area or atmosphere, environment in which to practice whatever we want to practice correctly? No. There's always strife going on. Again, each one of us has what we call this bono or self centered interests. Okay. More so, and not to put it down, because I also grew up in the West, but the idea of I, me, myself, and I. I'm number one. On paper, it sounds good, but when you have a thousand people saying, I'm number one, I want to be on top, you're actually just having a thousand people competing for this one spot. And you're causing everyone to be discord. Here in Asia, just out of culturally, uh, cultural backgrounds, it is group thinking because the idea of being there's so many people, especially in places like the continent of Asia and China, here in Japan as well. Everyone is forced to get along. So this idea of working together as a society, yes, it may sound socialist. However, this idea of group thinking, we are all human beings. So the, the concept of Buddhism has always uh, been a precursor to different kinds of teaching. It's for the best for all people. Not just one person coming up with this is how it's going to be. But the group thinking is, as you see in northern Japan and Fukushima, when the government 
is unable to provide for them. What happens? The community themselves all work together, all band together to bring about this recovery. And it's something that's happened over and over and over, not only in Japan, but throughout Asia. And especially when it's been a natural disaster, not a man-caused or a humankind-caused disaster. Again, the gold here represents the Buddha's light and compassion. Why? Gold was at that time the only element, and still is, that never tarnishes. So, although it's been refurbished, as you see here, a piece of gold that the people made about that was created 2,000, 3,000 years ago still shines and glitters. So, likewise, that's why this was used on our altars here to show that this light of the Buddha never tarnishes and it's always brightly shining. We may not be able to see it because our own, own no, our own self centered interests cloud our thinking. But when you hear about this working of the light, the working of compassion, it brings about this understanding. Just like I used the example earlier, what causes this feeling of love? It's, we have a saying in Shinshu that if you endeavor to listen, you come to hear this calling of the Buddha telling you to awaken to what life is itself. And that, for us, is been, uh, explained as Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu is not a spell. It's not some sort of, uh, uh, what word am I trying to use? Um, that we call out, to have something great, have this happen to me. It's not a prayer. Namo Amida Butsu, for us, translate this, I entrust myself to the Buddha of measurable light. The Buddha who comes from thusness of immeasurable compassion and immeasurable wisdom. When you come to understand something, it's not from your own doing, but it's due to all the experiences that I've just explained that have brought you to where you are. When those experiences occurred in the past, you may have thought, oh, that wasn't so good, or it was very painful, but as time goes on, you come to, to realize that pain kind of subsides. It's, it never goes away completely, but it helps to build, build your character, build who you are, to where you are right now. So this idea of uh, Shinshu is very, uh, as you might say, democratic. It doesn't tell you, you have to believe this. It's left up to you. Unlike other religions, you haven't practiced hard enough. You haven't prayed hard enough. You haven't done this hard enough. Well, Shinchu is telling you, you haven't lived. Come to that awareness. So live life to the fullest. But also understand that there's both this side and this side. And there's always consequences, both good and bad, to all of our actions. So it's not dogmatic and you have to do this if you want to go there. But rather, you're always going forward. You have a choice to do this or to do to do this. I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll wind it up with this. Uh, our morning services, as you can see, there's thousands of chairs. In, actually, there's over 3,000 chairs in here. Uh, currently, this year, we're, we're observing Shinran Shonin's 750th memorial. And people wonder, why do so many people come to this? We've been holding this for almost, a, it will be a total of over 100 days, or 100 sessions, 100 services. And the reason for this is we talk about Shinran's life at this time, because his life itself has become a teaching for us. It becomes an example for us. He was just a regular person, but he didn't create this to tell others, you have to believe this. Rather, he himself came to this understanding of what the Buddha's teaching, the working of Namami Dabutsus. And it becomes an example for us to follow. Uh, we always say, ask people in questionnaires, who's your hero? Why do we select those persons? Well, because of their good virtue, hopefully. 
not someone that, because of the uh, catastrophic uh, tragic things that they have done, but rather those who have made an impression, those who have led others to a better type of life. And so in so doing, we revered Shinran for his teaching, because his teaching went out to all people equally. So that becomes for us. Whether you become or follow Jodo Shinshu, this idea of helping others, feeling sympathetic, feeling compassion for others, is how we, for even for those who do not consider themselves Jodo Shinshu Buddhists, who do come to our services, because this is a way of life that I have selected. We're not imparting that onto them. Rather, it's a suggestion. If you also want to come and listen, you may. So Buddhism in that way is very open. You may come and decide for yourself if this is the type of lifestyle, if this is the type of way to live that you wish to incorporate into your own life. Um, okay, that pretty much concludes what I have to say because it's only been 30 minutes. I don't know if you have any questions that I may be able to answer. Uh, I purposely did not talk about myself I'll give you just a few minutes here of an introduction. I also grew up in the United States. I am a third generation Japanese American. Uh, I do not come from a temple family, but I have married into a temple. Uh, my relatives here in Japan were for many generations the same Jodo Shinshu. So my grandparents were amongst those who helped to establish temples in the United States. Uh, I'm from California. If you can tell by the accent, which has no accent. Uh, and I moved to Japan after graduating from university. I worked on the JET program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I taught English here. Came to realize that's not what I want to do. Um, became a minister, became a priest. Uh, I had all, always been involved with the temple in the United States, but decided to further my own understanding and study here. And took the next step and became a, a priest here and then also began working for our headquarters here in Kyoto uh, about 14 years ago. All authentic castle chambers that were donated to Honganji in the early 1600s. Uh, some of these, these here are replicas uh, because the originals, we place these here to protect them. Um, so they become so weathered that you were not able to see them. So a few areas are replicas, but the rest that we're going into are authentic. Okay. Uh, we do have another publication that if you wish to purchase or even just look at, gives a more detailed explanation of them. But these were chambers. The, all of the paintings are based on Chinese originals, because during this period, which would be the end of the Ming Dynasty in China, uh, relationship with China was still very good, so Chinese culture was very highly upheld. So we'll just, you can just go through. This is the chamber of the This is the South Knoll Stage. This is the largest outdoor Knoll Stage in Japan. just want to point out one, again, because of that idea, materials were very precious at this time. Areas that were damaged were repaired. And so you see this again and again. This is keaki. It's a very hard, dense wood, but also very hard to come by in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so they were used to uh, create huge temples, but then that's why it was repaired this way rather than replacing the boards here. Mm -hmm. This is the Tiger Canyon Garden. It's a noted garden here in Kyoto, and it's from the Edo period. Uh, it's a Japanese rendition of a, of a Chinese uh, dry landscape garden. This is a corridor leading 
into the shoin or the study chamber. Uh, since these were castle chambers, anywhere and everywhere that could be decorated uh, was done so. That's why the upper wall panels are that way. Uh, it is based on how temples and uh, castles were created in China. However, uh, coming through the Korean Peninsula, of course, it was modified and evolved. That's why Chinese temples and castles are all symmetrical. Whereas in Korea, the idea was slightly changed, and more so here in Japan, where it's asymmetrical. Although it's a long corridor this way, mm. the height of the doors and then also the uh, symmetry has been changed. <coughs> Here is the painting is very small in detail. This was used by Hideyoshi to change his attire before meeting guests. So the unique feature about it is the painting goes all the way around. It's a 360 uh, painting. stage. This is the oldest outdoor no stage in Japan. Now each of these structures, most of which were donated by Hideyoshi, uh, he was a commoner who came to become the high military leader. And so he, it's believed, liked this idea that Shinran had that the teaching and even this high, uh, high class culture should be for all people, not just those in the military and, and court. And that's why by donating them to Honganji, people from his same background, the agrarian society, to be able to come in contact with this level of high culture. To your left is the Shiro Shoin, or the white study, white wood study chamber. Um, of course, over the years, the wood has become darkened, but um, this is the mo innermost chamber. Hideyoshi sat on this highly raised dais, and then the, his vassal sat alongside on the horizontal horizontally lined tatami mats. Again, the paintings are from the Ming Dynasty and it shows a processional to the capital. <coughs> this is Nidoma, the second chamber adjacent to that. Yes, be careful of the... <laughs> <laughs> you battle with it, you're going to lose. I tell you that already. <laughs> I've done it many times. <laughs> And then this is the Kudakunoma, or the Chamber of Peacocks. Peacocks have been used mm. throughout Asia, especially from India. They were watchdogs, so to speak, because they kept away snakes, vipers. Mm. Also because they're very gorgeous. <coughs> you may have, if you watch the Japanese samurai movies, you may have seen this scene uh, oh. because this is an original uh, castle chamber it's been filmed extensively and mm. been used as models for sets and so again Hideyoshi set on the up highly raised dais there however the um, illusion is created here because the tatami mats laid horizontally and vertically makes the three rooms appear to be lar longer than they actually are when in fact each room is uh, square. It's three tatami mats by three tatami mats. Up above. These panels were also a kind of teaching tool. Note that some of the flowers have the white uh, paper wrapped around the stems. Any idea of why? Mm -hmm. See, some of them have white paper on mm. the bottom of the stem, mm. some do not. Mm. 
this was a clue for those who did this kind of flower arrangement because certain flowers the it does not draw uh, water very well and so the stems have to be kept moist while others are fine without them mm. okay. there's a step down here chamber perceptibums. Uh, here again, illusions are created because of the gates or the trellises. And sometimes the doors are taken out. Uh, note here, the rising moon. All of these chambers were meant to be seen from a seated position, but because you don't have very much time, it takes too much time to stand up and sit down. So just I'm just pointing some of these out. It's used in conjunction with the next room where the scene continues. Gangoma, chamber of wild geese. This is believed how this central Japan area looked during that feudal period, lots of marshes. And um, because of that, these wild geese used to migrate down here from Siberia. Once again, if you look from this vantage point, you can see the moon rising between the clouds and the flying geese. So that's how these two rooms were meant to be used together. Put a photo screen up there. Okay. Not allowed to step down. Chamber of Sparrows. And since it opens into this wide courtyard, the painting is very light. Okay. And our last chamber here. Mm. As you enter in here, look at the back wall of the stage here. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, for most of us, when we go to a theater or to a movie, we like to sit up front because you want to see everything up close. Well, Hideyoshi saw it from inside here. Those times, these drawers were taken out. And so he was able to view it from that vantage point. As you enter in here, step backwards in here and keep looking at the back wall and an image will begin to appear to you. Now turn around and look. Very ingenious man because those who sat up at the front weren't able to see the huge pine tree that comes into view. Mm -hmm. So for us as well, uh, this is another type of Buddhist teaching. We may be looking at something, but do we really see it? It's right in front of our eyes, but we're not aware of it. It's only when you actually stop and think about it. And also when your vantage point or your viewpoint changes, you become to become aware, you come to know something. Okay. This is the main audience chamber. It's also called Kono-ma because of the storks. Uh, it's hard to describe this because the Chinese characters are more uh, specific, but in English, it translates to storks. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we'll come to the front here. The back painting is the final scene of this pilgrimage or processional to the capital. It's of an Official, if you want to sit down and look, it might be easier to see. The official is leading three, uh, uh, four sages to meet the new emperor. There again, you see the peacocks in the courtyard. And then over here, although it has no relationship to our teaching, is of a uh, female wizard telling the emperor, uh, foretelling what the new dynasty holds. Uh, this 
once again, is where Hideyoshi met with visiting officials uh, when it was necessary for the imperial court, the crown prince or the emperor himself, to be present. They, of course, sat on the more highly raised side, the Jojo, Jojoza, there. And on occasion, there were even court officials who were not allowed to see the uh, crown prince or the emperor face to face, and so these bamboo blinds were lowered. So you just saw the outline of that. <clears throat> this room itself has the four seasons. Uh, some court ladies never saw the outside of these castle walls or when this was at the castle. And so they were only able to enjoy the changing of the seasons through these chambers here. Over to your right, up above, you see a plum tree. And then also within that, uh, the very fine lines of bamboo coming up from behind it. As you progress further down, this same tree changes from a plum tree into a cherry tree. Along the bottom are flowers of early spring. Continue down, you see birds entering the picture here, migrating back. In the far corner are flowers of early summer. And it progresses over here to the back corner. You see the pompous grasses of fall. And then you come to this evergreen, the uh, pine tree, amongst which are cranes, adult cranes, newborn cranes, and old cranes. Newborn cranes and old cranes are the black ones. Then amongst the trees, or the pine tree, are maples, and then also uh, peonies, both shakuyaku and botan. Uh, shakuyaku is, I believe if I get this right, in the spring, and botan is in the fall. Okay. They do not blossom at the same time, but here they are. Okay. This room was also used on occasion as another no stage when during the summer, when the rainy season occurs, and it was impossible to view from here, the outside stage. And so this central area, the tatami were taken out, and this was used as the stage itself. The, as you see, the cross beam up above here, and at the rear left, is slightly bowed this way, and it was used as they, what they call the hanamichi, or the entrance into the uh, stage itself. Okay. This room as well, uh, and this was another feature that they say Hideyoshi came up with, is, appears to be longer than it actually is, because the space between the pillars here are two tatami mats long, while after this wooden break here, it's only one and a half. Paramo, the Chinese style gate. Those of you who read Chinese or study Chinese, para in Chinese is read as hang. So this is <coughs> the style that was popular during the Three Dynasty. Very elaborate gate as you can see. It's also what we call our imperial gate. It's only opened when a messenger and a foreign official from the imperial court visited, visits Bongati. Uh, the gate itself is restored time and time again throughout history. The black that you see here is the same black lacquer that's inside of the halls. Uh, unfortunately, because it's outside, exposed to the radi um, outside the acid rain, other environmental problems, UV light, it breaks down. So it has to be restored time and time again. It's also called Higurashimo, and in English, it's translated as all day gate. And it's because it's so elaborate that one could spend all day here looking at all the different carvings and never uh, get tired of it. The animals that you see on the gate are kidding. And it comes from it's a fictitious animal supposedly appearing when the country is at peace and the Buddha Dharma is uh, being expounded. It's also uh, become famous because of the Kirin Beverage Company. And there are many stories behind that, but one being that uh, in designing the label for their product, they came to Honganji and asked to be shown the gate to get an idea. Anyway, this is Karama. Also there, as you know, there are three noted pavilions. 
King Kaku, the Silver Pavilion, King Kaku, the Golden Pavilion, and this is the third, Kiyun Kaku, and translated it's Flying Cloud Pavilion. It, this was originally located uh, north of here, close to Nijo Castle, and where the uh, Imperial Castle stands today. The location no longer exists. After Hideyoshi's death, Kiyun Kaku was donated to Honganji, and the lake upon which this structure stood uh, was filled in and destroyed. Um, Hideyoshi used this as a separate residence, um, mostly because as he grew older, uh, being from a commoner's family, uh, he was often the object of many assassination attempts. And so it's believed he resided in Hyun Kaku from time to time because the only access was by boat. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. But there's a skiff that's just on the other side of the bridge there. This is a replica. Uh, all of the originals, unfortunately, were lost, were destroyed during World War II because uh, fuel was uh, in, uh, insufficient. And so many items that were not used were burned uh, mm. for cooking, etc., etc., for heating. Uh, Hyun Kaku is different from uh, Ginkaku and Kinkaku in that it's asymmetrical. Uh, the, on the left is the this undulated gable, karahaku, which is a Chinese style, while on the right it's the simple irimoya, which is a Japanese style. The second level is again, once again, a Chinese style, while the third, the top, is the Japanese style again. Mm. The interior is very similar to the chambers that we just came from. And right here is the bell for Hongwanji. The large temple though. Okay.